How do you feel when you stare out at the ocean? Are you calmed by the hypnotizing motion of the waves? Have you ever felt the crippling sensation of thalassophobia? Well, I can speak with confidence that if you want to experience the horrors that the sea has to offer, Subnautica is the right game for you. Some people are absolutely captivated by the gameplay. The thrill of building a base on a world that's completely yours and discovering alien secrets. On the other hand, there are people that are absolutely petrified by the time they finish the game. That's what we're interested in today. The game opens with an intense situation as you're shown on a tumbling life pod, desperately trying to escape a burning spaceship that explodes above you. For a second it looks like things are going to be okay in the end, but as you're falling, a massive explosion causes a shockwave that throws your life pod, causing a loose panel to fly off and slam you in the head, which knocks you out cold. When you regain consciousness, your life pod has been engulfed in flames, and as the scalding heat threatens to burn you alive, you're greeted by a mechanical voice that is frantically trying to get you to extinguish the surrounding fire. As you frantically douse the fire with your extinguisher, the situation begins to stabilize and a sense of relief washes over you as the immediate danger of being baked like a fucking potato has passed. That's the first trick the game plays on you. Have you ever heard of a bait and switch game? This style of horror is one that is most commonly seen in psychological horror games, but to summarize the genre, it basically involves laying out the bait by introducing the player to a part of the game that makes them feel calm and safe. Then you gradually make them feel more and more uneasy by revealing just enough to let the player know that something's off before hitting them with that big reveal, catching the player off guard in order for the reveal to have maximum effect. Intentionally or not, the stressful introduction to the game followed by immediate relief is something that inadvertently lowers your guard because of the sudden change in pressure. What Subnautica does here is not directly make you feel like you're in a safe and comfortable situation, but it does make you think that the worst of your problems are behind you for the time being. And so, a seemingly normal tutorial ensues after that harrowing situation. What awaits you after the originally panic-inducing introduction is a shallow, bright, and friendly tutorial area where there are lots of harmless flora and fauna, and where the scenery openly welcomes exploration. The sun easily pierces the crystalline pale turquoise water, providing a clear line of sight, something that's an especially precious luxury underwater. This is the first trap that Subnautica is laying. As you progress in the early game, it'll continue building a friendly exterior on the surface that tries to hide the horrors beneath. Your first hour of gameplay will most likely involve following the PDA's instructions, restoring the life pod to a suitable condition, while crafting tools and finding sources of sustenance. This is one of the calmest stages in the game, as you'll be exploring an area where oxygen is pretty easy to get to. And there's not really any risk gathering resources, as basic metals are available in easily accessible deposits, and organic materials won't really be able to put up any resistance to you, as they lack the ability to do any real harm. The safe shallows accomplish the goal of lulling the player into a false sense of security by allowing them to familiarize themselves with the environment and their current circumstances. Of course, there are still threats like starvation or dehydration, and small shocks like the crash fish, but after the player adjusts to those dangers, they'll start to feel more comfortable in exploration because they can start to become complacent with their situation. This way, the player will feel like they have a grasp on the situation. And it's the perfect trap because getting somebody to feel like they have control is a much easier way to get them to lower their guard than trying to convince them that there are absolutely no threats, as that would probably set off too many alarm bells for it to be effective. Even in the possible surrounding areas, this type of false security is imposed upon the player by introducing them to dangers that might seem like a challenge at first, but aren't actually that difficult to deal with. The first few predators you might encounter can't even be considered threats because of how easily they can be dispatched. I mean, after seeing a stalker for the second time, they go from being mildly intimidating to just being annoying to run into. So keep that in mind. Anyways, for the player to progress, they'll need two things, blueprints and a whole host of new materials. Vehicles like the Seamoth and Cyclops, both of which are necessary for exploration and transportation, can be unlocked through scanning various fragments and then being built. They are expensive, and sometimes you can spend a while trying to find them. More importantly, the player will also unlock interior modules for their base that really restrict their progress. 
Take the modification station, for example. This thing lets you upgrade your safe diving depth modifications so that you can go deeper underwater with your vehicles. There are also modules like the battery and power cell charger, which you need since you can't keep making new batteries every time one runs out of charge. And believe me, they will run out of charge. This need for resources and blueprints brings us to the Aurora itself because it has significance to the plot and it has a lot of valuable resources that are on board. The game also threatens you by saying the Aurora will fucking explode in 24 hours and wipe out all life on the planet. On board, you'll find a treasure trove of nutrition bars, collectibles, and a... breakup letter? However, the prize held in the Aurora is the Prawn Suit, with the fragments being exclusively located inside its vehicle bay. Once you make it in, it's only a matter of scanning. As you approach the felled spaceship, the clear water gives way to a cloudier, dirty solution, turned murky, being tainted with dirt ripped from the ocean bed. If it's your first time in this area, then you'll probably be eager to explore your surroundings because there are a lot of resources that are scattered around the edges of the aurora in various crates. There are also your run-of-the-mill enemies like sand sharks and stalkers. These things are bait, distractions. This is not a place where you want to lose your focus because when you least expect it, The Reaper Leviathan might be the first time you actually encounter an active threat to your safety. It's the first time where you are completely powerless with no hopes of ever fighting against it with your current capacities. In a situation like this, your fight or flight response kicks into full gear and what follows after that response is an extreme all-encompassing panic that is desperately trying to figure out what in the world you're going to do as you're face to face with a sea serpent that's 20 times your height and length and can literally swallow you whole. Of course panicking in a situation like this is not the best thing to do because it can make you freeze up when that's the exact opposite of what you want, and so the moment of hesitation when you're deciding how you should deal with the situation is what leaves you vulnerable to the reaper. Like most sensible people, you'll probably think to yourself, I should get away as soon as possible. You might try to pull out your sea glide in an attempt to escape or fumble around while facing imminent doom like I did, but remember, it's still your first time encountering anything like this, so what's most likely going to happen is you're going to end up in the cruel embrace of this thing's jaws. And let me tell you, when you're recording at 5am in a dark room and your family's asleep so you can't scream, the only thing that you can do is cry. I cried when this happened. Fought against. The game presents them as monsters, similar to the type you would expect from traditional horror games so that when the player does encounter them, they're petrified. The subversion of expectations of having something like this done in a survival game is a factor that makes the jump scare that much more effective to begin with. This is what completes the bait. For the entire first part of the game, you've been getting adjusted to playing a survival game, and you've been getting comfortable. You aren't using the right protocol to handle something of this caliber. If you knew that the game was actively trying to scare you, you would probably be able to see the signs ahead of time and brace yourself for impact. But the way Subnautica does things, it doesn't give you the chance to alert yourself to danger, it just throws you into the midst of it. What I said earlier about having no hopes of ever finding them was in the context of the situation. In reality, it's a little different. The thing is, Reaper Leviathans basically move like trains. They can move fast in a straight line, but they can't change direction as easily. For example, this guy can dodge them better than you can dodge women. If you knew this beforehand, you would have been much more calm, and getting close to one of these things probably wouldn't be as big of a deal. This is where we see the Bane Switch come into play again. In the early game, you were never given a direct warning that something on this scale even existed. You could only infer, leaving you unprepared for the eventual encounter. After the first encounter, you'll eventually learn tactics to deal with these. For example, you can literally ram your sea moth into one of them in order to drive them away, and it comes equipped with a sea moth perimeter defense that will electrocute the daylights out of them if they try to touch you. Veteran players are so in their element that they will kill leviathans in the most absurd ways just because they think it's funny. A new player would probably never even have the idea of taking one of these things down across their mind because of all the setup of how comfortable they got, and this isn't just comfort in the sense of the game. They got used to the idea that boss fights would be a standard situation where you could decide if you wanted to start the fight or not. Your only warning that something like that pesky danger noodle was in the game might have been your PDA screaming at you about Leviathan class lifeforms, but you didn't know what that meant until you actually ran into one of them. New players would probably freak the hell out just because of how much more of a threat a Reaper Leviathan is in comparison to a stalker, and that overwhelming feeling of panic would set in instantly. They're basically forced into a situation that would be much more intense than if they had full control on when and where they would have the conflict. 
The bait and switch element works especially well in Subnautica compared to other horror games because the baiting began before the player even started playing the damn game. No one expects this type of manipulation from a survival game, so when Subnautica actually pulls it off, it hits hard. Subnautica also differs from the classical survival game formula in a few different ways, but the difference that's the most relevant to us right now pertains to how Subnautica doesn't give you all the information off the bat. When you're navigating the areas where the Reapers live for the first time, you're probably not going to have any alarm bells going off because you don't know enough to be afraid of what they are yet. The game's maps and various locations stay constant, but none of this information is made explicitly apparent to you, so you're basically allowed to wander around with absolute freedom and discover things on your own, which in most survival games is cool because that's basically the definition of open world. But the key differences is that in other open worlds, you'll usually know what to expect. Oftentimes, there will be patterns like specific summoning methods for bosses' dungeons, ways to get food, mob spawn rules, and so on and so forth. This type of information is handed to the player, but not in Subnautica. You have to go and figure figure out what to do all on your own, and you aren't even allowed to craft things until you find the fragments. If the game decided to leave you in the dark about crafting, why would it directly tell you the exact danger in the area? Instead, you have to come to that conclusion yourself. The lack of information, combined with the fact that it's also much harder to see in order, makes it so that you are forced out of your comfort zone. Humans without information are akin to fish out of water. So when you suddenly come into contact with something 20 times your size that seemingly appeared out the blue when the closest thing you've encountered to a real threat is a stalker, the sudden realization that something like the Reaper Leviathan out can feel completely unexpected. A universal fact for all jump scares is that they all depend on the context of their situations. They need the first few moments of the game to be calm and comfortable so they can build tension through uneasiness. They need the player to play along and completely immerse themselves in the world. Subnautica crushes this executing this formula with mastery even before the first time you click play. After the first tango with the Reaper Leviathan, the player is no longer as naive or as confident as they once were. They've become painfully aware of what the game truly has in store for them. This realization is also coupled with a change in perspective. The player can no longer trust the world around them. They know just enough to know that they know nothing. And the fact that they know nothing means that they have room for speculation. Now you have a newfound sense of paranoia following you throughout the rest of the game, always wondering if there's something hidden in the darkness waiting for you to make a mistake. This type of paranoia is something that shows itself in the form of players now exploring new areas with caution, as most people would definitely not want to run into another Leviathan class predator. However, this type of alertness is something that makes it much more difficult to catch the player off guard, which means Subnautica has to use the player's paranoia to its advantage by feeding into it. This new uneasiness created a tension that is exacerbated by the player's actual exploration options. If you hadn't noticed already, at the top of your screen is a depth gauge that measures how deep underwater you are. As you progress in the game, your options for exploration all begin pointing down. There are are several consequences to traveling deeper, and the game will use these consequences to whittle away at your willpower. One of the most important consequences that results from progression and exploration is the continual decrease in oxygen efficiency. 98.3% of the game takes place underwater, and that combined with the fact that humans don't have gills makes drowning an omnipresent threat. The primal instinctive need to breathe air has been evolutionarily hardwired into every single one of our brains. Even as babies, we are born with the ability to hold our breath and slower heart rates if we detect that we've sunk underwater in order to conserve as much oxygen as possible. It's something that we've all come to be very familiar with. When your oxygen runs out, you have four seconds, and if you aren't able to find air in those few precious moments, you will die. It's a biological weakness, older than even the skeletal remains of the gargantuan leviathan. In the early game, the player is aware of how they need to keep their oxygen topped off, but because it's so easy to get oxygen just by swimming to the surface, they end up getting used to having it always available. Admittedly, it's pretty easy to avoid drowning for most of the game because you can just hop into the nearest vehicle, but where the pandemonium really sets in is when the game lures you into situations where you can easily get lost in the sauce, as my AP bio teacher once said. In any survival game, you need to collect materials, and in Subnautica specifically, you need metals and gems in order to synthesize new equipment, build vehicles, and create habitats. This necessity for raw material is something that becomes more and more demanding as time passes, so when the player inevitably runs out of these raw materials, they'll go looking for more. In an attempt to locate these materials, they'll dive deeper and deeper, and they might be tempted into exploring an underwater cave. If you weren't already aware, Cave diving is notoriously disorienting, and the game even tells you this. In the caves in the safe shallows, there are plenty of brain corals scattered around that serve as a source of oxygen, so it's pretty forgiving if you ever lose track of your oxygen there. But in the late game, you aren't afforded this luxury, and instead you're punished even more for forgetting as the caves bend and twist with ever-increasing complexity, with the surface being far above. 
in a cave, there's usually only bioluminescent light, and it can really induce claustrophobia on you because you have to constantly remember where the exit is on top of having your movements restricted. They're also infested with things that want to kill you, and it can range from crabs out of hell to poisonous stingers. In a situation like this, it's not impossible to forget about your oxygen, or more commonly, how to get back to your oxygen source. This type of trap is also laid out by the game in another form. Rex. Entering one of these places feels like stepping into an optical illusion. The wrecks force you to weave through narrow tunnels that bend endlessly in order to make it into the ship. There are only dying dim emergency lights and battered broken cables burning as sparks of electricity soar, fading in the pitch black saline. More often than not, you'll have to cut open heavy steel doors, which waste valuable time. Bringing external light sources into these places is imperative, as the vent openings you might have crawled through blend in almost perfectly with the black steel that lines the walls, making it nearly impossible to determine the location without external light. Wrecks can be embedded into the ocean floor at an angle, making it hard to tell up from down. And in one of these situations when you're already confused and disoriented, hearing oxygen is when all hell breaks loose, because that's your signal to get the fuck out of there as soon as possible. These situations are extremely panic-inducing and stressful, and what makes it worse is that looting these wrecks is essential to progressing in the game, as they contain blueprints so every player will eventually have to make their way into one of these damn things. The setting of Subnautica and the punishing breathing mechanics is actually something that other horror games try to do to a certain extent as well. It's usually shoehorned in as a way to build tension, having some resource that the player needs to manage in order to keep them on their toes. This could be energy, hunger, whatever, but the point is, those usually only apply in certain circumstances, while Subnautica's threat of drowning is constant. The deeper you go, the more terrifying things get, because they also get bigger. In these places, the color we do see is now more ominous. Let's take the Jelly Shroom Caves as an example. The lighting scheme here is... purple. It's a stark contrast from the bright and vibrant colors of the Seychelles, or the calm blue hues of the open seas. The dominating light of the sun holds no sway in this place. The Jelly Caverns are painted purple. Illuminated by the massive translucent mushrooms, it is a sight that is reminiscent of a small streamer's LED lit room. It's an unexpected sight because in nature, purple is a rare color. Before synthetic purples were invented, purple was literally worth its weight in gold, which makes it a little uneasy to look upon at first. Remember that for now. The caverns are a prelude to your experience in the latter half of the game, and specifically, what you should expect to transpire as you continue your journey. One of the inhabitants of the jelly caverns is what we'll be focusing on. The crab snake is definitive of how predators will function as you traverse deeper, because of how it hunts you, and because of how patient it is. If I had to summarize their strategy, they're basically campers that hide in their hidey holes until they think that they can snare you. They take advantage of the jelly shroom's allure and hide in their caps, waiting for an opportunity to strike at you. When they're out in the open, they're hidden by the gleaming purple caps, shrouded by bioluminescence. It's also important to mention that the crab snakes will only attack if you get close to them, as they'll quickly lose interest once you start to swim away. The lack of natural light and charm of the jelly shrooms can sometimes deprive the player of the focus that they need to spot a crab snake in order to avoid it. The bioluminescence is very pretty to look at. Unfortunately for us, it might mean the deliverance of an unwelcome surprise in the form of a crab snake desperately trying to bite off our heads. I mention the crab snakes because it gives a good perspective on how apex predators in their depth function. After you pass 200 meters in depth, sunlight is no longer able to penetrate the depths as it simply becomes too difficult to pierce the water that far before being dispelled. In this type of place, you might not be able to see things, but that type of restriction isn't something that's universal to creatures down here. Naturally, as you lose your sense of sight, you become more dependent on the next best thing. Remember that idea of not being able to see. It becomes more and more relevant as time passes. You'll most definitely have to visit the blood cup trenches in order to collect the necessary components for this red stuff. As the PDA accurately states, This ecological bio matches seven of the nine preconditions for stimulating terror in humans. This place is what some would describe as a nightmare. Strange white kelp blossom, not with flowers, but with pulsating sacks of viscous crimson slime that resemble freshly coagulated blood. Blood crawlers measuring six feet tall, teeter in caves that were cut from the sides of the trenches, blindly and ferociously attacking anything and everything unfortunate enough to enter its range of motion as it desperately searches for its next meal. Deep sea acid mushrooms thrive on the trench floors, unimpeded in their growth, as most potential predators would definitely meet certain demise even at the slightest touch. 
The lack of natural light basically means your only source of vision is artificial light, and there are risks that come with using it, so it's best to be cautious. Uranonite and Ruby line the walls of the trenches, tempting the player to exit their vehicle and snatch the precious gems. There is a certain comfort that comes from being inside a vehicle. When you're operating one of these things, you're offered a form of safety due to the fact that your fleshy meat body is encased in several tons of titanium. In the depths, vehicles also provide light, a luxury, and they let you move much faster than you can swim. Vehicles can also afford you a second chance at life if you're ever caught in the mob of Leviathan. You can dismount your vehicle to make a quick getaway. Unfortunately for you though, warpers are one of the main predators that inhabit the blood kelp trenches, and you will most definitely find one waiting, watching your every move. You might not have realized it, but you've actually intercepted their communications, as they're basically robots that hunt down anything they consider to be infected. The problem is that you are one of the things they consider to be infected. In case you forgot, warpers have the ability to teleport you into their very, very unloving arms. Well, I mean claws to be specific, but it'll do a good chunk of your health, and that's the damage you suffer in-game. The crushing insecurity that results from being torn away from the comfort of your vehicle in a place like the Blood Kelp Trenches is comparable to a man being emotionally vulnerable. And this is in addition to the literal crushing pressure you're experiencing from being so deep underwater. You see, the vehicles provide a sort of mental separation from the outside world, tricking your brain into thinking that you're actually safer than you are. So when you're randomly forced to leave, it is incredibly jarring, similar to somebody pulling the sheets off of you to wake you up. Not only are you in a situation where you need extra protection, the omnipresent threat of drowning also rears its head the moment you get out of your vehicle, so you better be prepared to get back to your vessel as soon as possible in the event that you become separated from it. The combination of all of these factors is an overwhelming anxiety and a voice that screams at you to get back inside as fast as humanly possible. Vehicles are definitely necessary for deeper exploration, but as you traverse the depths, you need to be careful not to alert any creatures that might be lurking in the depths, and this becomes especially difficult when you're piloting a massive submarine that makes a ton of noise just by moving. In fact, you can't even move at full speed for more than a few seconds without risking a massive spike in noise, and the engine overheating and lighting on fire. The Cyclops also isn't as maneuverable as the Prawn Suit or Seamoth as it can't strafe left and right, so you need to tread lightly from the get-go in order to stay away from any danger. The Cyclops has unlockable upgrades that make travel safer, such as creature decoys, a shield generator, a sonar, and a silent running mode, but you can't always rely on these upgrades because they have a massive energy cost, which means your most reliable option is to travel at slow speed and use the sonar occasionally. Possible threats up to the Cyclops are shown in yellow, and threats that have noticed you are shown in red. These conditions of forcing the player to move slowly and be constantly conscious of their movements and predators is yet another source of anxiety that is built on top of the already terrifying conditions of being so deep underwater. The Cyclops is also pretty expensive to build, and usually the player will take them with an additional exploration vehicle to get to places where the Cyclops can't. This, in addition to the expensive upgrades and stored resources, makes it extremely punishing if you ever lose the Cyclops and have to abandon ship. When under attack, you won't be able to escape like you've been able to with other vehicles, so you have to resort to your insult modules. Mainly your shield generator and creature decoys while racing away at flank speed, but of course there's a catch. These upgrades cost a lot of power, and in situations like these, you need to be ready to lose a lot of it. The shield generator itself takes 5% of your total power per second, a massive energy drain, and this is on top of moving at flank speed. Once you do manage to get away, you still need to repair the submarine from the outside, and this isn't the same type of repairing as the other vehicles, no. You need to find the actual breach in the hull and seal it up. This takes considerably more time than repairing other vehicles as well, and it's another way the game forces you to get out of your comfort zone, physically and mentally this time. If you mess up and deem the ship beyond saving, then your only option is to get into your exploration vehicle and try to get away as soon as possible. Now, imagine the vulnerability of being torn away from your vehicle, but worse. In the Cyclops, you are almost on the same level as the rest of the Leviathans. That's why attracting them was a danger in the first place. When you're forced to leave, you get knocked back down to the bottom of the food chain. And in situations where this can actually happen, it's most likely going to be in a location that's infested with predators, which only makes it worse. The Cyclops is an overall positive, 
But the fact that you now have something afraid of losing on top of all of the anxiety from the environment, potential threats, and drowning, it really does make for an effective horror experience. And what if you do get away? You're suddenly in a much worse position because you're basically stranded at the bottom of the ocean in a prawn suit. And that's not meant for long distance travel. You can't stay in the suit forever either because eventually the suit will run out of power and then it'll, be, it'll really be game over. Piloting the Cyclops is certainly a pleasure, but there will always be a doubt in the back of your head as you dive deeper. You'll probably be using the sonar more than a few times on your journey and it's truly bone chilling when it actually picks up on a threat. Oh also, you can only guess what it actually picks up on because it could be the difference between a reaper leviathan and a fucking eel. Okay, so now we know that it's probably the best idea to try and make as little noise as possible, but that's only half of piloting the cyclops. We still need to know where we're going and because we're humans, the main navigation sense we use is sight and that requires a lot of light. But if you forgot, we're hundreds of meters underwater so the sun can't reach us. However, the Cyclops does come with some pretty powerful floodlights so we should have at least a decent field of vision. We do have to be careful though, turning on the lights basically means you're a beacon for unwanted attention. The things down here that can see have extremely sensitive eyes, they have a need to capture the little light there is, and you better believe that they're going to be swarming towards us. The risk of using light is another way the game robs you of comfort. If sound was showing not telling, then light is absolutely telling because the fact that you can't see anything means you can't anticipate the impending doom. That's why it's so common in horror games, but in Subnautica it's much worse. In any other game, you at least know the specific types of monsters in the dark and the threat it poses to you. You know how to not die when being hunted by animatronics. You know how to run from an angry school teacher. You know how to listen to your parents' footsteps, so you know when to pretend like you're asleep. What you don't know for sure is when some scary danger noodle is going to notice you and decide to crash into your cyclops the same way a moth slams into my bedroom window at night. One of these moths is the crab squid. It has 10 tentacles of a squid, but they've been replaced with crab legs and they also have a massive stomach in their head. What makes it worse is that they can emit an EMP and shut down your electronics. This is bad news because all of your tools and vehicles are in fact electronics, so the proper way to deal with it is to shut off all the lights and wait for it to go away, but this only works if you figure out there's a crab squid in the area. A crab squid is probably not the most dangerous leviathan, but it's still a danger regardless because it's much stealthier in comparison, and this stealth is what makes an encounter so much scarier. One of Subnautica's key differences with other horror games is that it doesn't restrict the movement of its own predators. The only condition that has been explicitly set is the fact that each leviathan occupies its own territory and usually won't leave it. A monster is left to roam a specific path, even if unintentionally, because in other games, most level designs are compact and leave little room for improvisation. But Subnautica doesn't have that problem, since the predators can move in all three dimensions on account of being in water. In horror games, Obstacles actually provide protection, even if they get in your way initially, because you can get pretty good at getting around obstacles, while the pathfinding of the thing that's chasing you usually doesn't change. Unfortunately in Subnautica, the enemies can basically no-clip on account of water being a liquid, so once you're detected, they'll most definitely be descending upon you in a straight line from god knows where. You might have already realized it, but to know where it is, you either have to see or hear it, but we're going to ignore the hearing part, because if it's headed towards you, it's probably going to try and make as little noise as possible, so that leaves you with sight. Now, the thing is, you can see a little bit with the lights off, and that's where the problem originates. If it's traveling towards you, then you probably won't know for a while, as the movement patterns are fairly unpredictable. When it dawns upon you, you're suddenly greeted by a giant squid that can literally tear a sea mouth apart like Swiss cheese. If the setup wasn't done before this, then the moment would have been much less effective, because it wouldn't make any sense. The flexibility in the movement of predators leaves room for many opportunities for a scare. Just having so many options is already disorienting, and this combined with the fact that the game intentionally lowers your field of vision leaves a perfect setup for the game to exploit the fear of the unknown. After all, that's what most horror games rely on at their core, and Subnautica just so happens to have it down to a T. What makes it worse is that the specific type of information hole that the player is subjected to, they know that there's something there that can kill them, they just don't know when it's going to happen. The fact that light isn't reliable is only one part of the equation though. The other half is sound. All humans are born with two inherent fears. The fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. I don't care about the falling part because it's basically impossible to take fall damage for 90% of the game, but the fear of loud noises is what really makes an impact when you play Subnautica. Sound is, beyond a doubt, the easiest way to get into somebody's head. When you hear things, you're really detecting the speed and frequency at which longitudinal waves hit your eardrums. That's why music has such 
such an effect on some people. It's basically like giving your head a massage. It's also why you can use sound to influence somebody's emotions, which is especially useful when you want to scare the shit out of somebody. The most obvious part about Subnautica is that sometimes it can be quiet, not as in there's no sound, as in the only sound there is is a constant ambient white noise. Some people like this noise so much that there are multiple videos on YouTube that have just this ambience for hours on end. The ambience is one of the most effective ways a game gets to you. Subnautica's white noise is very comfortable, but for the same reason it's also unsettling. In Subnautica, you're the only person on the entire planet, and your only company for the majority of the game is a robotic computer voice and the occasional psychic message from the Sea Emperor. Other than that, you're left with only voice messages and periodic warnings which can leave the player with an intense feeling of isolation. This loneliness is something that's more effective than you think because you know deep down that no one is coming to save you. The people that tried to save you were shot down, and the people you reached out for help care less about you than they do about their lunch. The only person you can depend upon is yourself. The fact that you're supposedly completely alone makes it all the more terrifying when you're swimming around minding your own business when suddenly you hear a roar that tears through the silence of isolation and drowns out all of the comfortable ambient noise. The sheer contrast between the comfortable quiet and the explosive scream of a predator is something that is bone chilling. We've already gone over how sight isn't as reliable as it is hundreds of meters underwater as it is on the surface, and this can make the player even more dependent on sound. Even the music of Subnautica feels cold and mechanical reminiscent of what you would expect to hear from the Portal 2 soundtrack. It's always fitting no matter what you're doing because it can range from a dark and mysterious melody that rings every time you dive deeper, or a synthetic drill with a strong beat behind it. What we would expect from game soundtracks would be extravagant boss theme songs or songs with pristine vocals that perfectly match the tone and atmosphere of the situation in which they are played. It may not seem obvious at first, but the apathetic, unfeeling soundtrack of Subnautica complements the world perfectly because it's analogous to how the ecosystem as a whole is unfeeling cold. It doesn't care if you get eaten, and the players at the top of the food chain would delight in it. If the music was intended to intentionally scare you, then it wouldn't match up with Subnautica at all, because at heart, it's a survival game. Trying to artificially engineer a horror game inside of your survival game would probably backfire because everybody interprets their own methods of survival differently. That's why having a soundtrack that remains neutral even in the most dire of situations is all the more effective. Now take everything that I just said and factor in the fact that your sense of vision is also gone and now you have a recipe for an effective way to build tension. Sound is one of those things that can be used to foretell events. Hell, that's exactly what rhythm games are, but sound is usually something that can be reacted to. For example, if you've ever stayed up late either gaming or scrolling on your phone when you're not supposed to, your tell or telegraph that your parents are approaching is the sound of their distant footsteps. When you hear them slowly getting louder, that's your cue to pretend like you're asleep as they check on you. So when they eventually leave, you can go back to doing whatever it was you were doing. In Subnautica, it works a little differently. For starters, the ambience that the player constantly hears, it's already unnerving enough. The tension of just waiting for something to come on your radar, or for that screech, is intensified by this ambience because it's basically like staring out into the abyss. You can technically see, but it's not helpful if the only thing you can see is the exact same shade of blue. The ambience disguises threats from you through auditory deprivation, just like how the lack of sunlight disguises threats from you through visual deprivation. All of that tension that is built up from this sensory deprivation is extremely effective and it intensifies the actual moment of the jump scare so much that it can make people never want to play the game again. They are well aware of the fact that the moment they hear the explosive booming cry of a leviathan, they better get ready to run for their life. When you take into account everything Subnautica has to offer, it's really incredible to see how much depth the game has. There's one last thing that ties everything together. The drowning, the darkness, the quiet. It's the fact that you never have to experience any of these things if you don't want to. All of these things are hidden below the surface of the game, waiting to be found. Even if the game tries to nudge you in the direction of these horrors, it's not like you have to listen. For example, 
The main driving storyline behind the Subnautica is the fact that you've been infected by the Kara bacterium, and you're basically going to die in a week if you can't find a cure. It's a similar existential biological death as Drowning because it puts a time crunch on the player to go and complete the game, exposing themselves to the horror elements in the process, but it's not like you actually have to go and cure yourself. The game isn't going to kill you if you just screw around without a care in the world, because it won't even make it clear what's happening until you get to a certain point in the game. For example, the PDA will tell you that it detects high concentrations of foreign bacteria in the water, but until you scan yourself, you won't be alerted because the car has very few debuffs on you. It's also not like you have to go near the Aurora at all because the only important blueprint there is the prawn suit, and if you decide not to explore past that point, you won't even need it for most of the game. When you choose to progress the game, that forces you to open Pandora's box, as you can decide whether or not you want to engage in a situation where you might actually interact with the Reaper Leviathan. After all, a Leviathan isn't going to leave its territory unless you intend intentionally baited out. This is a common pattern, as leviathans inhabit areas of importance but are also used as ways to control the player's movements. If you even try to go out a certain distance, you'll immediately be set upon by 20 adult ghost leviathans, and let me tell you, it is definitely an experience. The strategic territories of reaper leviathans are complemented by the temptations of new resources, and this leads to the player making their own decisions, stay complacent and continue with the game becoming more and more stagnant, or face your fears and progress. The longer and less informed this choice is, the more effective the horror elements become. It really is like opening Pandora's box, because the longer you wait, the more you want to do it out of sheer curiosity. Of course, balancing risk and reward is how the game gets you to do things in the first place, so it would make sense why the most dangerous areas of the game are also the ones with the most valuable resources, but there's also another way the game can get to you. That's why the gradual buildup of paranoia was so important. It's because it facilitated the transition of the player's expectations and changed the source of the raw terror from shock to dread. By having elements like sensory deprivation, Subnautica is able to complete a jigsaw puzzle that brings it all together in order to create an element of horror that truly complements the game itself. Adding horror elements so masterfully to an already solid game was like placing the jewel in the crown. It became a main focal point while still adding to the overall act. Atmosphere. Because of this, it is able to embrace the concept of horror in survival extremely effectively and with a level of grace that can't be easily replicated by other games. So now we've come to the end of the video, and it's time for some closing thoughts. Subnautica does an incredible job at executing both horror and terror by not completely relying on only jump scares and only chase sequences, or even pure psychological horror. It's a blend of these elements that offers a real experience, and Subnautica is one of the few games that is able to pull it off. In the modern age, we've gotten really comfortable, and we've tried to separate ourselves as much as possible from the days where we only hunted for survival. It's it's hard to encompass how much different that was from our current lives, even in our survival games, because they're kind of cleaned up and watered down, and that really does take away from the experience. Because for most people who have the opportunity to play video games, survival is a distant thing for them. That's why most games completely ditch the horror elements of survival entirely in favor of other aspects of the gameplay. It's hard to make drowning scary, it's hard to trick the player, but when it's well done, it can become a defining feature, and it can be a source of renown for the game. And that makes it all the more impressive how Zemnatka uses horror. Listen, I know I promised the next video would be shorter, but then some things happened. I've learned my lesson now, and this time I'm not going to promise anything to you. So instead have a cookie as my apology. Thank you for watching.